Buonasera a tutte e tutti, eh, benvenuti a uno di, degli ultimi eventi di questa dodici, undicesima edizione di Trieste Next, Festival della Ricerca Scientifica. Eh, come sapete questo è uno degli eventi del programma internazionale della manifestazione per cui da questo momento in poi inizieremo a parlare in inglese. Welcome everybody, uh, this is one of the last events of the 2022 edition of Trieste Next, Festival of Scientific Research. Um, tonight we decided to invite, and we are honored to have uh, with us, uh, one of the leading experts in water issues, food nutrition, and uh, on a global scale. And uh, I would like to welcome to our stage uh, Professor Jan Lundqvist. Please give him an applause. Thank so you. this afternoon we'll be speaking about the perfect storm, uh, climate change, water scarcity, and uh, 8 billion consumers. Before uh, giving uh, him the, the floor, I just wanted to highlight that we are very happy to have him back in Trieste, because we had invited uh, Professor Lundqvist exactly 10 years ago. Uh, we decided to, at the time, in uh, 2013, Uh, we decided to focus the whole uh, festival on water and water issues. Uh, so, 10 years onwards, uh, water issues are a crucial topic of our time. Uh, if we uh, limit the uh, analysis to Italy alone, we can see that 2022 uh, was uh, the driest year in 500 years, uh, that we had uh, 45% less rainfall uh, only this year. Uh, so, uh, the, the issue of water is not something like long-term to discuss, but it's something that is becoming an emergency. And uh, Professor Lundqvist tonight will uh, explain us why and how we can deal with it. So, Professor Lundqvist, I will give you the floor. And, uh, of course, the floor is open to questions and answers from the audience, so feel free to raise your hand at any time and we'll hand you the microphone. Welcome back to Trieste. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I, I'm, I'm extremely happy to be back. Thank you, as you said, I was here in 2013, and I have been told that uh, this is this Trieste next is the 11th edition of this. So this means that it's quite successful. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the perfect storm of water. Climate variability and eight, nine, or even more billion of people. The first, uh, just uh, a couple of short comments on the title. Have you heard about the perfect storm? It's very good. It's, it's a movie. It, there's also a book written about it. And it's about an incident outside the coast of Canada and US in October 2000, uh, sorry, 1991. And the perfect storm is described as the conference, as the, um, um, uh, the happening of a number of forces at the same time. So it is the, in, uh, what happened outside Canada and the uh, US in, or, in October 1991 was the combination of low pressure, of uh, tropical warm water, and, and a number of different meteorological phenomena. And together, these different forces, they created this is called the perfect storm. The waves out in the sea was about 10 meters high. And when the water reached the coastline of US and Canada and the estuaries in the narrow parts, they had waves up to 30 meters of water. So you can imagine, it was a fantastic natural phenomenon. And, and, and this, the notion of the perfect storm is then also used in political and economic connections. And now when we hear so much about the climate change and the, the very dramatic situation that you have had in Italy now during the um, summer, 
And in Pakistan, you probably have heard that one third, one third of Pakistan, one third of the area is underwater now. Sweden, I'll show you some figures, but Sweden, which is generally believed to be a water-rich uh, society, we have had a very dry summer. So in Sweden, although we have a lot of water, we have sinking groundwater levels. And uh, three years ago, 2018, we had a very bad situation for the farmers in Sweden. Now, the, the, what I will focus particularly is on the climate variability, so not so much climate change as such, but the fluctuation of climate from, shall we say, from season to season, even from day to day, there is a big difference in terms of the precipitation and also the amount of evaporation back to the atmosphere. So that I will come back to and talk about. Then I've also put here eight, nine upon, uh, dot, dot, dot billion people. When I grow up, when I was a student in the 1960s, the world's population was about three billion. Today, we are eight billion. And uh, eight, uh, 2030, we are supposed to be uh, 8.5 uh, billion, and we will soon reach nine, probably more. Now, we have to think about this because the, the amount of water that is available for drinking, for agriculture, for industry, for, for all, the times, all the things that we need water for, that is the same. So it's not the water that has become less, but it's the amount of people and the people's needs and wants that has grown, that have grown. So the, we often hear, and I don't know in Italy, but in Sweden and in, in international media, we have about water scarcity. But it would be, I think, um, uh, it would be correct to also say that we have to uh, compare the amount of water which is more or less stable with the uh, dramatic increase of population and, and uh, the human needs and the wants. Now, um, Water is, um, we know water from religions, we know water from, um, from uh, literature. We, we are all uh, fascinated by water in different contexts. So I would like to start this presentation with a short um, overview of what we call the, the wonders of the world. You probably all heard about the seven wonders of the world. We have the seven antique wonders of the world that were before the Christ era, so to speak, before, uh, before Christ. So here I have uh, up to the left, uh, this is a picture from uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So that was one of the first antique um, wonders, which is about uh, six, seven hundred years before Christ. Now, we don't know if these gardens actually existed. There's no documentation. These are just, shall we say, rumors, this kind of mythology. So, uh, but I took this picture to show that there is, of course, there was also a connection between water and um, vegetation, crops and such things, also in those days. Then the picture below is from the Maya culture in the Yucatan in Mexico. And the, Yucatan, sorry, the Maya culture is um, it at its peak of culture around 1400, uh, between 900 to 1400, something like that. And it probably went under. It was probably destroyed because of drought. So there are different kind of theories why the Maya culture, which was very, uh, very elaborated in those days, why it could not continue. And probably one of the main reasons for its uh, for, uh, do falling down is the, the climate situation, the climate change, and in this case, the drought. Then you, you all know, of course, the, um, the picture from Colosseum in Rome around uh, a few years after Christ. And then we have the Taj Mahal in India, which is also around uh, 1400. 
And then we have in the middle, um, between uh, the, the last two slides, we have the, the Christ, the Redeemer from Rio, the Cidade Maravillosa, Maravillosa, I think. I don't know the, the Portuguese uh, pronunciation. And this, uh, the, the Christ, the Redeemer, it was built, I think, in 1920 or something like that. And it was built to, uh, because it was, uh, Rio was supposed to be a sinful city. So, but it's now one of the, um, the new wonders of the world. Then to the right, we have two uh, natural wonders of the world. The one on the top is from, can you guess from where this picture is? Victoria Falls. Victoria Falls, no, it could have been. It looks about the same. <laughs> now, this is from Iguazu Falls. So it's part of Brazil. It's between Brazil and Argentina and Paraguay. And then on the bottom right is uh, from a country where Antonio has been working for three years, I, I heard this morning. It's from uh, Vietnam, the Ha Long uh, area bay, the, uh, the bay of the uh, descending drakes, is it? Yes. So the, the, we have in, 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 the, um, in the history and in our uh, presentations of the world, we have different wonders described from both the man-made uh, features as well as from the natural features. Now, I think we, it, it's, it's good to know that, um, that humans are capable of doing these kind of masterpieces. And it's very good to know today when we talk about the, the uh, problems that we are facing. So I would like to contrast uh, these uh, the seven wonders with what I call the seven water worries of the world. And as I mentioned um, initially, I think that one of the biggest problems that we are facing is the climate variability, the, the variation in rainfall and the droughts and the, the floods, and you have had a lot of that in Italy this summer. And as I mentioned, Pakistan is very badly affected. We have a reduced per capita availability of water, so the amount of water per capita is going down as a result of population going up. We have a quite considerable lowering of the groundwater. I will show you some slides later. We have a lack of coordination in, uh, in different uh, respects. I mentioned here water and energy because that's important in agriculture and food production. I will come back to that also. And then we have, if we look from the food system, if we look from, from production, from what the farmers are doing, over to the industry, food industry, and to the consumers, if we look upon the whole chain of food flowing from farmers' field, into our plates, into our stomachs. There's a very low efficiency. I will come back to that also. We have pollution, which is a huge problem. And then we have what I would call the human factor. Now, I have some illustrations of, uh, of these different points here. The, the, the photo, up, or sorry, the, the graph up to the left is a uh, is from uh, uh, Mozambique, it's from a measuring station outside Maputo, and it shows the variation in rainfall for each month of the year. Hmm. Ah, sorry. Oh, I cannot... Uh, for every... Um, if you go from left to right, it's every month of the year. So there are 12 measurement points, and then it's over 100 years. So you can see that the rainfall from uh, one part of the year to another part of the year varies quite a lot. And uh, for the farmer and for also other people who are dependent on water, it's very difficult to plan because they don't know when the rain is coming. So this is one of the, the um, uh, should we say, uh, aspects of climate variability. <clears throat> And you can see to the, the picture to the right, that is actually from Sweden. So Sweden, which is supposed to be a country with uh, 
lot of water, but not this type of water problem. So this is from a, uh, from a situation in the western part of Sweden, around 1980, I think it was. In the middle, the, the photo to the left is from Libya. And you know, Libya is very rich in oil, and they have the energy to pump water. They, uh, when Gaddafi was the, um, was the president in uh, Libya, he decided to pump water from the fossil aquifers deep below the, the sand of the Sahara. So they have pumped water, water, fresh water from the depth of down to 2,000 meters. And they were planning to, to lead that, to pump that water up to the uh, coastal area where they have good agricultural land. So this is an example of a country that has a lot of energy and that they were uh, short of water, fresh water, and they could solve it in, in the way they thought they could solve it. The, the picture that to the right is from an area outside uh, Johannesburg in um, South, uh, South Africa, where they um, empty the uh, sewage from the city just outside uh, the city. So you can imagine that these create a lot of, of problems for, for both the... Um, they cannot use this water for anything, of course, and um, the, the, there's no, not possible to, to have any agriculture, for instance, or something like that. Now, the human factor is, um, I think we're all aware of the fact that, that females are the big drawers of water. So if you look at the country in Africa, but also in other parts of the world, females are um, responsible, are taking the responsibility to, to, to bring water, to draw water from faraway places to the households, and they can walk up to, let's say, five kilometers to fetch water for the daily household requirements. The last uh, picture here to the right is from Charles Claude Juncker when he was the, um, the EU president. And I've taken one of his expressions, which I think is quite, quite telling for, shall we say, the uh, problem of decision-making, of policy-making. He said like this, that we know exactly what needs to be done, but we do not know uh, how to be re-elected once we have done what needs to be done. And this is maybe something that you can remember when you go to the election tomorrow here in Italy. <laughs> So I think that there are different types of human shortcomings, of human challenges that make it difficult to have a policy, to have a management, which makes it possible to have an efficient and a fair and a proper management of the water resources. Now, when we look upon the, um, the, uh, the, the Earth, uh, our globe is called the blue planet. So if we, if we come from, um, from space, if we go on aircraft, we see most of the, of the ground is covered by water. So about 70% of the land area is water. And if you look upon the biosphere, all the parts of the, of the globe where there are living creatures, either human beings or plants, animals, whatever, then we have to include also the top layer of the ocean, because fish, different type of species in, in, the, in the oceans. Now, if we look upon uh, the, the, um, uh, the area of the oceans where you also have the possibility for life, the water is dominating much more than we usually think. Because on Earth, we, on, on, the glow, on, the, um, uh, on the planet, we have agriculture, which is only a small part of the area. But in the oceans, we have land, we have the um, biological life in a large spectrum, down to a few hundred meters, at least, below the, the surface. But in a, a totally, of the total amount of water on Earth, the, the salt and the brackish water is around 97%. So it's only about 2 or 3% of the water on Earth, which is uh, fresh water, which we can drink, which we can use in agriculture, which we can use in uh, industry and such things. 
And out of the fresh water, most of it is fixed in glaciers. They are sinking, they are melting now, but still um, more than, uh, well, about 65% perhaps today are in glaciers of the fresh waters, in Antarctic and Arctic areas and so on. And then we have a huge amount of fresh water in the ground, below uh, the ground area. But to, to make use of the groundwater, we need energy to pump it and to uh, lift it to, to different uses. Then we have the amount of water that most of us are relying on. That is the water in the rivers and in the lakes. That's a flowing water. And that's only about 1% of the total amount of water. Now, when we have this, these are the general figures if you are looking into um, hydrological literature. But then they usually don't mention the amount of water that is available as, as soil moisture the invisible water that's available in the road zone, a few decimeters or a couple of meters below the surface of the ground. And that is, a very, that is the vital part for vegetation. It's not the water on, on the top. If you have irrigation water, that's important, but the water must be going down into the earth in, and be creating um, soil moisture in order for the plants to pick up the water. So this is a very essential part of the water, but in the literature it's usually not uh, so visible. And then we have the last part here, the amount of water in the atmosphere. Um, I don't know if you know about that, but um, water vapor is one of the most potent greenhouse gases. So we have about... Uh, uh, what I call here a, uh, a bed cover of about uh, 13,000 cubic kilometers of water in the atmosphere. And that, that acts as a greenhouse gas. So if we didn't have the water in the, in the atmosphere, we would, have about, um, we would have a temperature on Earth which would be about 30 degrees below what we have today. So the, the, the role of water is very important in the atmosphere above us. It's important uh, where we are on the ground, and it's important below us. Now, there is, of course, a huge variation in the availability of water between different parts of the world and, um, and different groups of people. And there is a change over time as a result of the population increase that I mentioned earlier. So if we look upon the global average, if we take the whole, fig the whole um, amount of water on Earth and divide it by the number of people, in 1960 it was about uh, 17,000 cubic meters per capita per year. That's the amount of water that's flowing through society, so to speak, per year. Now, today it's about 6,000, and the result is not that we have less water, but that we have more people. <clears throat> now, you can see that there are huge variations between the different countries. So, in Canada, for instance, which is the most water-rich country in the world, the amount of water in 1960 was 156,000 <laughs> cubic meters. And today it has gone down a bit, but it's quite a lot of water anyway. And for Sweden, it uh, was 23,000, 1960, and now 17,000. And for Italy, about, uh, according to the official figures, 3,800, now 3,100. Now, if you compare that with the situation in the Middle East, we are very water-rich. If you take countries like the Gaza Strip, uh, Jordan, and um, uh, most part of, of the Middle East, they have much less water. A country like Egypt, with a population of, I think, 80, 90 million now, does not have any own water, so to speak. Most of the water comes from the Nile, which is coming from the, the um, area around uh, Lake Victoria, primarily. So, well, we have a problem, I think. But I will now start with some slides about the, um, 
the connection between water, energy, and food. But maybe we shall just take a minute of uh, and asking you if you have any comments or questions so far. With the uh, growth of population, do you not think the government should take more interest into trying to reduce some of the population because of the shortage of water? And that applies to all governments. Yeah, no, I, 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 think, I think I fully agree. But it's a non-issue. It's not on the agenda. It's not on the uh, uh, sustainable development goals. Now, when you hear about this discussions about climate change, the population issue is virtually absent. And when I ask my colleagues, when I ask people in the United Nations, for instance, there are different explanations, but you sh I think the main explanation is that it's too sensitive. You know, there were attempts earlier on to um, introduce different kind of family, um, family control measures in India, for instance, and in other countries, but um, they, well, they failed and it has become a lot of protests and for, for poor people especially, poor people have huge families in general. Huh? Uh, children, a no, large number of children is, is the, the joy of their life, so to speak. So it's a very difficult kind of uh, question and, uh, yeah. C'era lei, signora? Okay, that's one. Thank you. Uh, referring to the previous question, I would ask if you have uh, ever heard of the TED talk uh, um, spoken by Bill Gates about the reduction of uh, the possible poss possible future population using uh, and uh, mm, uh, using the elf to to uh, uh sanificazione uh dell'aumento della della cura delle popolazioni a rischio okay ma la domanda non l'ho capita però eh se lui aveva sentito che cosa si fa ovviamente se riferimento al TED Talk di Bill Gates che parla della riduzione della popolazione tramite la vaccinazione dei paesi vaccinazione He's referring to a TED Talk by Bill Gates in, delivered in 2010 uh, oh. um, talking about the reduction of the world population using vaccination if you have any comments no, on that. No, I, I, I'm not aware of that, but uh, as far as I know, he's, he might have talked about it earlier, but as far as I know, he's not talking about it now. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's not so much a question as it is a comment in a way with regard to population control. Um, th thus far, uh, the most sort of uh, effective measure for population control is women's education. Yeah. So the higher education of women, uh, the lower, um, the, I mean, the smaller the growth of uh, population, especially uncontrolled growth of population. I, I fully agree, fully agree. Yeah, okay. So maybe we can move on. So yeah, we move on. Yeah. Yes, time is running, yeah. So anyway, so let me now say a few words about the connection. We need water for everything. We need water for drinking. We need water for agriculture and we need water for industry and so on. But we also need, we, apart from water, we need energy for, for agriculture. I've used here a slide from, this is from South India, to illustrate that um, this is paddy production, uh, rice production. And as you can imagine here, this is a hot area, above 30 degree, degrees usually, and as you can imagine, when water is like this, a lot of it will just evaporate. So to produce a kilo of rice in this area, it will require several tons of water. So water, pro uh, sorry, food production 
is water intensive. Now, it's also, we also need energy to produce the food. We need energies for our tractors, for our different uh, equipment. We need energy in terms of fertilizers. We need energy for all different types of inputs into agriculture. So energy is also one other important part of agriculture. And as we know, en energy use is also part of the climate change problem. Now, I think that's one important uh, lesson which very few people are aware of, namely that if we look upon what's happening in the food chain from the farmers, then the food industry, up to the consumers ourselves, the, there's a difference in, 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 in the sense that water is very much used by the farmers in, in production. It's not so much used in industry. And when we do preparation of food at home and in our kitchen, we don't use very much water. I mean, to boil potatoes, to boil rice and so on, it's not very water intensive. Now, if you compare that with the energy use, it's quite the opposite kind of situation. Because the energy use, even if we think that big tractors, uh, harvesters, all the um, uh, equipment that the farmers are using, we, we think that they use a lot of the energy. But compared with the energy use in the households, this is small. So the aggregate, because we are now 8 billion people, and when all of us are cooking and, and uh, refrigerating our food, whatever it is, it consumes energy. So if we combine the energy use in the different households, the total energy use in households is much bigger as compared to water. And I'm saying this because I think this is important when we are designing policies, when, when, the, when our uh, politicians are trying to find out what should we, how should we be saving, how should we be making use of our resources in the most efficient, efficient manner. It is different when we look upon water as compared to energy. Now, this second um, thing I'd like to say here is that um, if we look upon the amount of food that is produced in the world, and if we look upon it, what has happened during the period from the 1960s, for instance, up till to now, up till now, in 1960, we had a world population, as I mentioned before, about 3 billion. In 1960, there were a lot of starvation. There were huge problems with food in India. We had, we had um, big um, uh, problems with hunger. And there were in other parts of the world, in Africa. Although the population was much smaller. So in the, during the last uh, two or three um, uh, generations, there's been a tremendous increase in agricultural production. So the, the graph here to the, to the left here, The top line, it shows the, the amount of food increase on a per capita basis from 1960 to 2013, and then the projections. You can see that the amount of food produced in the world has increased quite significantly. Still, we are talking about food problem, but the, the, the amount of food produced is much higher than it has been before, even though the population has increased. So the, the per capita production has increased. Now the line in the middle, which I call the supply, the availability, that is the amount of food coming out into shops, into the market. Now that has also increased. But the difference between these two lines is that um, when the farmers are producing, let's say, uh, cereals, wheat, rice, maize, whatever it is, a lot of that uh, could have been food, but it's used for feed, for the animals. So when we go to the market, we want to buy both, uh, we want to buy um, uh, rice, we want to buy wheat, bread, whatever it is. But we also demand milk, we demand uh, meat and such things. So the difference here is that a lot of the primary produce is used for feeding animals. Now the thick blue line in the bottom is the amount of food that is recommended by the medical profession, by doctors, by nutritionists. 
And as you can see, it's, it's lower than the other ones. So we have a growing problem in the world today with an uh, increase in the overweight and the obesity. So there is a big imbalance in, in, uh, in the world. And uh, the, the first uh, the, the, um, picture to the left is for the energy content, the, the calories in the food. But this is about the same situation for the protein. And protein is important for our health, for, for our muscles and, and so on. And also you can see here that this, there has been improvement both in the high-income countries, like Italy, Sweden, and so on, but also in the low- and the middle-income countries. But there is a, as I mentioned before, so there is a huge variation in uh, food security, in the food um, situation for different parts of society, for different socioeconomic groups. So here I have a student, I had a student uh, who did a study and compared the food situation in three different countries in Africa. And she also looked upon how is the food situation for the, the low income people, the middle income people and the rich people. And then she, she transformed, she used these figures to, uh, to calculate how much water is used to produce the food that the rich people are eating or buying and the poor people. And you can see there's a huge internal differences in a country between the diets of wealthy people and the poor people. So if you take Tanzania as an example, you can see to the right uh, the, the high income diet. To produce that diet, what they are eating, it, for some people, it would require up to 45 tons of water per day. That is the amount of water required to produce the food which is demanded or used by the rich people, as compared to the poor people, which have a much, much lesser impact on the water situation. Let me take one more example here from... Um, namely from Sweden, we usually talk about food consumption, which I, food consumption is something that refers to the amount of food that we are buying, and the amount of food that we get in schools and in hospitals and military training and such things. Now, that is different from the amount of food that we are eating. So the food intake is very different from the food consumption. So I had another student who was also looking into the, um, the differences between uh, the recommended level of intake, what we should eat in terms of fruits, berries and vegetables, and, uh, and what, we actually, uh, what they're actually eating. Because the, the, these kind of food items, they are very important for nutrition, for that we should be healthy and have a good life, so to speak. And you can see here that uh, for, for both for women and for men, and both for the vegetables and for the fruits, there are very, there's a very big difference between the recommended level of uh, intake, which is about 500 grams per person per day, and the actual intake. So when, when we measure how much food people are actually eating, it's much less as compared to what they are buying, or what they have access to. So that means that there is a huge loss or waste of the food, because when people are buying uh, these kind of, of items, they're usually throwing away a large part of the food uh, after one or two days. You go to the market and you buy uh, lovely uh, fruits and vegetables, but then the next day they don't look so nice, so then they throw it away. Huh? And this is what's happening in Sweden. Uh, I think that's another aspect that I'd like to mention also, namely the, um, the uh, changes in perception on food and changing food habit over time. These posters are from the, both from the First World War 
after the First World War and after the Second World War, so from the 1920s and 1940s. And at that time, we had, of course, a problem with food uh, as a result of the war, but also a low productivity in agriculture. So then there were, uh, these are from US and from, from UK, there were different uh, information campaigns trying to convince people to take care of the food and don't waste it. Now today, the, the situation is very different. We have a um, number of studies that show that the, the amount of food that is produced and which is lost due to technical problems, uh, lack of storage, lack of transport and such things, and also the amount of, of food that is thrown away, that we put into the waste bin, that amount of food is about one-third of the food that is uh, produced. Now, if we also add the amount of food that is going into overeating, that we eat too much, then the amount of losses, waste, and overeating is in the order of 50% of the food produced. Did you know about that? It's a huge, it's a huge challenge. So when we talk about food problems, food security, it's to some extent a, a production problem, but it's very much is a problem which is connected with other aspects of the food system. So what do we do about this? I think there are three main types of areas where uh, changes have to be made. One is that we have, a, in our part of the world, in Sweden, also among the young people, school children, we have a problem of overeating. People eat more than they should. Because food is cheap now also, and it's abundant. We have, especially in, in African agriculture, in other parts of, of agriculture in the world, we have a very low productivity. The water and the land is used very inefficiently. And then, at least in Sweden, we have a, a discussion about the need to modify our diets. We don't have the Mediterranean diet as you have here, but we have a less um, healthy diet. So I think that's a combination of different um, areas where, where policies can be introduced to overcome or to reduce the problems that we are facing in the world today. I think I will jump this because this is a little bit, yeah. So then finally, uh, um, a few words about the, um, the so-called Greta Thunboy effect. I know from Antonio that this is very much discussed also in Italy, the impact of the young generation and especially the, the, uh, the stimulation that has been uh, pulled by Greta Thunberg from Sweden, who started with her Friday marches. I heard you had this in Trieste yesterday. So we had election in Sweden also uh, two, three weeks ago, I think, no? It was on the 12th of, uh, of um, August, yes? So a couple of weeks ago. So we thought that there might be, now with the climate change and, and uh, all those kind of problems, and the, these activities uh, that have been going on in Stockholm for quite some time, we thought there might be some kind of impact on the voting uh, in Sweden, but there was none. And if you look upon the... the, the uh, Perceptions or the attitudes of the school children in Sweden. There are very few school children in Sweden who have the same kind of worry that is being uh, pronounced by Greta Thunberg and her followers, of course. So when we look upon the, um, who are the change agents? Who are the people who can be willing and capable of uh, stimulating the kind of change that we would need in order to deal with climate change and also the food issue. It's a little bit um, 
problematic. So this is finally, this is a picture from the Tonle Sap Lake in Cambodia. It's a lake which is, uh, is very much uh, changing from one time of the year to another time of the year. So I think the young generation and we, of course, also, we are on a risky voyage to the future. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lundqvist. If you want to take okay. a seat, yep. uh, we have almost 15 minutes for a Q&A session. So if you have any comments or uh, questions that you want to share with Professor Lundqvist, we are here with him. Is there anyone who wants to start the discussion? You just need to raise your hand. Here is one, please. If the professor could expand a bit on the groundwater table levels, I mean in, in terms of uh, towns, nations that are experiencing actual problems with uh, water for drinking, for living, for the towns, and uh, like Milan this year, for instance, in, uh, yeah, yeah, in, okay. in Italy, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's important because, you know, um, when the water in, in, on... The, the water in lakes and in rivers, when it has become more uncertain, I think more and more people think that the groundwater is the, is the, is the good resource to make better use of. So in, I think in all parts of the world, there has been a, a more intensive use of the groundwater. And I can take a few examples. Um, I've been working in South India for many years, uh, and in the south of India, which is a fairly dry area, they have been lowering the groundwater table by about one meter per year for, uh, I don't know, for quite... You know, they started with the Green Revolution in the 1960s. And the Green Revolution was a, um, uh, was a, a way to introduce new... Uh, seeds to have a better crops and to have a full uh, realization of the potential of the Green Revolution, they needed water. And since the, the, uh, the monsoon climate in India is very variable, I think those people who could uh, afford and who had, a prob who had the um, technology, they went for groundwater. So that's why we've seen that there's been a gradual uh, lowering of the groundwater. And as I mentioned, Libya in North Africa, they are pumping water from the Nubian uh, uh, aquifer. There's, no, there's virtually no rain. So the only water source in Libya, in, um, in other parts of that area, is the groundwater. And Libya had the energy, they had the money during Gaddafi's period. So they started huge projects to, to lift the groundwater. California, California has been, uh, uh, to a large extent, to the farmers in California. They have been lowering the water table down to six, seven hundred meters, according to, um, to my colleagues. So people have been trying to find out the groundwater extraction in, in the U.S. In, in California, they, are, they don't get the figures. It's a very sensitive issue. Because the farmers, they have invested huge amount of money in the pumping, for, for, especially for cattle, uh, but also for um, uh, different types of fruits and vegetables. So they are very reluctant to, um, to tell us about how much the groundwater level has been sinking. You know, they have, they have, um, they have a legal system which regulate the amount of water that the, the farmers are allowed to, to lift, but it's not, uh, they don't uh, follow those rules. You know? uh, there's corruption, there are different types of, uh, of, of ways to get around this kind of uh, so, so what I say in California now is that the groundwater level has been reduced to the extent that the water flow in rivers has been declining because the, the flow in the river comes to some extent from the groundwater. So when the groundwater is going down, 
the amount of uh, water flow in the river is also going down. And that will affect the fisheries, it will affect the estuaries, and um, so there is a kind of now, when I speak with my colleagues in, in the US, they say that they don't believe in the legal system. They don't think that the politi politicians can handle this. But maybe the, the different interests between farmers, between fishermen, between environmental groups, between those who are taking care of the, uh, the situation in the estuaries, maybe that is a um, new situation which will balance. But you know, the, the farmers have invested millions, millions of dollars into very powerful pump sets. They have bought up the land, they have planted uh, tree crops. Uh, so it's not a one-year uh, crop, but it's, it's a cropping pattern that will be lasting for, for several years. And um, China, China is the same. Uh, north of China, around Beijing, the water table is dropping. That's why they have been, uh, they're now taking water from the Jiangxi River and, um, and leading it up to, to the North China Plain, to including to uh, including Beijing. So, so you say all all over the world, we we have in Sweden. We also have a, a sinking groundwater table. Sweden, which is a water-rich country, <laughs> we have uh, we have bands. So I I live on the west coast of Sweden during the summer period. We, as a private person, I'm not allowed to use. Um, I can only use a hoe uh, and. Um, bucket water. I'm not, used to, I'm not allowed to use a, a, any uh, from, uh, from a tap water. This is Sweden. Thank you. There's a question there. Thank you. No, no. Ah. Are there uh, any any projects in the world to exploit the salty water from the, from the seas? Yes, there, <coughs> there are. There are, um, there are two, two types. Um, one is that uh, there are, um, there's research going on, 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 shall we say, modifying plants. So you can cultivate plants in brackish water, not salt water, but brackish water. So Israel, for instance, um, they have tomatoes, they have different types of fruits, and they say that the tomatoes, which are grown in salty, brackish water, is sweeter than the tomatoes used, uh, using fresh water. So in terms of quality, the food that you can produce in brackish water can be quite high. So that's one type of, uh, shall we say, avenue that you can modify the crops so that they can be cultivated in areas where you have brackish water. The other thing is, of course, to desalinize uh, seawater. And again, Israel and South Africa, California, um, Australia, they have, um, they have plants for desalinization, but um, you know, I think that the cost of desalinization now is down to about half a US dollar per cubic meter. But that's just the production. Then you have to deliver the water out to the different uh, places where water is required. And then one of the big problems with the desalinization is the, the brine. The salt, the salt will remain. <laughs> because you're removing the salt, but the salt will remain. And if it's a coastal area, you don't have any place to, to um, deposit the salt. So there are technical problems, and um, in in Middle East, they say they can they can afford to use uh, desalinate, desalinated water for drinking purposes, but not for agriculture, because the amount of water used in agriculture is so much bigger. So desalinization might be useful in um, in uh, some parts of the urban system, maybe to some extent an industry, but mainly for drinking. 
Because when we, we, we go to shop and buy water, we pay a lot, don't we? Pellegrino, I don't know how much you pay for Pellegrino. But the consumers, they're willing to pay a lot for bottled water. More than for milk or for other, um, other things. So I think there's a market for, for those kind of things, but not for agriculture. Well, on a similar note, um, are there any avenues to explore the percentage of water that you said is quite high that is present in the atmosphere as a vapor? Since it also have, uh, it could it could have an effect on lowering the greenhouse effect uh, it has right now. So, is it usable? You mean to change the the amount of uh, exploit the amount of uh, water that the present atmosphere by I don't know condensation without relying on the rain. Well, I, I, I'm not aware of such attempt, but I think it is, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's about 13,000 cubic kilometers. So it's such a huge amount, even if it's a small part of, so to, to modify that, um, that amount by any kind of, shall we say, industrial or, um, I think it would be extreme. I don't think it's possible. So it will, it will be changing probably as a result of climate change and to what extent the, the, the water vapor is a more efficient greenhouse gas as compared to carbon dioxide or, or methane and those gases, I, I don't know really, it's, it's beyond my um, knowledge. I, but there is a change of course in the combination of greenhouse gases including vapor. There's a question over there, in the middle. Thank you. Uh, what about uh, water quality? Like microplastic is a big issue. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. That, that is a... Water qual quality in general is a... Uh, or the, use of, the, use of, the safe use of water is, of course, a huge problem. In, uh, the, I showed a picture here from South Africa when they are just uh, disposing the sewage outside uh, Johannesburg, and it could be in any other city. And, and when, you, when you are walking around, you'll be living in Vietnam, so you know it from there, of course. When you're walking around in, uh, well, especially maybe, but both small and big towns, it, it's, it's rather um, strange that people are surviving at all. So probably there's some kind of uh, immunity which are protecting people from... But we have a lot of diarrheas, we have a lot of different type of infections that are related to water and... Um, but, you know, the, the water quality problem is much more expensive to deal with as compared to the water quantity problem. Because you can, you can pump water, you can convert, you can... Um, divert water through technical means, through different uh, canals, sluices, whatever. But to treat water to, to a safe standard is, is, is very expensive. So, yeah. Yes, what's your opinion about hydroponic agriculture? Hydro? Hydroponic, the agriculture. Uh, yeah. I, I, um, I don't know. It's, it's practiced in the Middle East, I know. But I don't know very much. I think it's, it's not for the average farmer. I mean, for the average poor farmer in Africa, where we need to have a more efficient, more productive use of water, land, I don't think... I don't know the, the economic... There is a program of UN uh, something about hydroponic in Africa, because it's... Uh, very efficient in terms of growing agriculture it's with really a little amount of water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. It's true. It's they use it quite a lot in uh, in the um, Arab uh, world where they have a lot of money, where they have the, they have the energy. But I, as far as I know, it is very little used in Africa. I don't know. Do you know about African? Where in Africa? In ah. Huh? Kenya. Kenya. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, th I think it's probably... Um, 
You know, when it comes to agriculture and to make better use of water, I don't have it here, but I could have mentioned to you that we, we, there are studies from the World Bank, from other, from uh, different colleagues, who have shown that the farmers in Africa, in different countries in Africa, they are very poor in, in co coordinating the use of water, the use of, of um, uh, fertilizers, and the use of improved seeds. So that I think that those, the, if, you, if you would have a kind of um, uh, educational system and, and demonstration where you could show farmers that if they combine water, fertilizers, good seeds, they have the possibility to increase productivity quite significantly. So I think those are much more simple measures as compared to hydroponic. Can you say a hard one? Yes. Hydroponic. I, I think so. Uh, I think we have some minutes left for a couple of questions, if you have any. Uh, while we wait from the audience, I know that you have an extra slide that we decided to add uh, during a brief discussion we had uh, before this lecture. Yeah. And it's concerning the use of water in other kinds of non-nutrition farming, for example, and other yeah. industries. If you can further develop. Yes, yes. Uh, Antonio mentioned this. You, uh, we had a cup of coffee before here. And he said that it could be useful to uh, show some figures on the how much water do we use in uh, food uh, production, food systems, and how much water is used, for instance, for cotton shirts, uh, the cotton production, and um, then in the industrial production, and also to produce ethanol. Uh, and then this graph, uh, this um, slide, I put together maybe five years ago, so these figures are not up to date. So it was just, uh, we just talked about it during, uh, just before him. So here you can see on the left hand side a uh, different um, amount of water for different food items. And compared to, for instance, cotton shirt is of course quite water intensive. Tea, uh, if you take a pair of jeans, it would be the same, of course. Because the cotton, when you grow cotton, it requires a lot of water. And when you compare with industrial production, probably this figure is very rough. It, it depends on what type of industry. And the, you cannot compare it by kilo of industrial production, but you have to compare it with the value or the price of the industrial production. And then also to produce um, bio, biofuels. These figures are old, so I think they should be not be used. But, but as I mentioned to Antonio, there's one very important difference between the, the water use in agriculture and in cotton production as compared to industrial production. Because the water use in agriculture is in the open landscape. So when the farmers are using water, most of the water goes that way. It goes back to atmosphere as evapotranspiration. And you can't stop it. That's part of the natural world, so to speak. But if you use water, if you use water in an um, intelligent way in industry, you can recirculate, you can reuse the water. So the amount of water that was used in industry, let's say, um, a generation or two generations ago, was much higher as compared to today. And the amount of water used in industry in, in India or in Africa is much higher as compared to your use in, in Italy or in Sweden. So, but the main difference is that between the biological production system in the landscape and the mechanical industrial system in urban settings inside buildings. So they, they, you cannot, uh, you cannot in, um, decrease the amount of water in agriculture very much. I think in agriculture, the main gains is probably among us consumers. Because as I mentioned before, the amount of food waste is a huge water waste. So if we consumers, and specifically the rich people, the affluent people, the trendy people maybe, if they would modify the food habits, it could have a huge impact on water, on climate, so on. 
Uh, here you can see uh, I made some comparison here between the amount of water which is used for drinking for household purposes, for the physiological requirements about two up to five liters, depending on if you are, have a manual work, and uh, but the, the amount of water for the the diet. If you have a vegetarian diet, it's maybe um, um, about a ton of water per person per day. But if you have a heavy animal diet with red meat, it could be five tons, it could be much more. So change in diets is important for health, it's important for water, it's important for the climate. And yeah, I think so. Okay, so this is a, a very well-deserved applause for you. I didn't mention in the introduction that you're now working as senior scientist at the Stockholm uh, Water, International Water Institute. So from your point of observation, uh, what are the challenges related to water that are foreseeable in the next future? Yeah, I, I think, yes, I mentioned it. I think that the biggest problem now is the climate variability. Because the climate variability has been, um, I mean, f for those of you who have read the Bible, we know about the, the, the seven lean and the seven fat years. The seven fat cows that were eaten by the seven skinny cows <laughs> and so on. Now, so the variation in water is a historical phenomena. It's not, it's not a new thing. But the, the amplitude is much bigger now. And that is part of the global warming kind of, of change. So the global warming, the, the climate variability, I think, is, is a huge issue. Personally, I think that the, the demographic situation is serious. Because we see the population increase, particularly in areas that are water scarce. We see a rapid population increase in parts of Africa where there's very little water and where the water is very unstable. Uh, pollution, that was mentioned by you here, pollution, oh, sorry, by the lady there. Pollution is, I think, a um, serious problem because it's ex expensive to deal with. And you don't see the, the, you don't see the, um, the pollutants. You can drink water, think it's, it's safe, but it, um, because you don't see the pollutants. And, and um, well, that's a big problem also. Unfortunately, we have to leave the room yep. for the next event, but please, uh, another applause for Professor Lundqvist. I would like to thank you as well for attending this event today. The international program of our festival is uh, ending right now, but we'll be talking about astronomy in just a few seconds with uh, Professor Guido Tonelli, a physicist and the discoverer of the Higgs, Bosone di Higgs. Uh, so in just a few minutes, the, we'll leave the room to another field of science. Grazie a tutti e buon pomeriggio a Trieste Next. Thank you Professor very much. Professor Lundqvist, thank you very much. Thank you.